YouTube superstar Natalie Wynn, better known as ContraPoints, recently released a feature film length video tackling the very thorny subject of cancel culture. Here's a taste. The promise of canceling was that it was going to give power back to people who had none and bring justice to prominent abusers. It's in a way the 21st century version of the guillotine, the bringer of justice, the people's avenger, but also like the guillotine, it can become a sadistic entertainment spectacle. And I want to make the case that we do have, well, a teensy bit of a reign of terror situation on our hands, Gorge. And Natalie now joins us via Skype. Welcome back to Rising. Natalie, great to see you. Hi, Crystal. Thank you. Nice to be back. Um, were you nervous tackling this topic? Because I feel like it's it's fraught in general, but it's also fraught when you're someone who has personally experienced the wrath of the internet. It's hard to put something out that's thoughtful that doesn't come off as somehow self-serving in a way. Is that something that you were worried about, nervous about? How did you approach it? Oh, I was very worried about it. Um, I mean, it's actually a topic that I'd wanted to cover for probably two years, but I'd sort of always put it off because I sort of thought like, well, this is going to be really hard. And what's the point? Because, you know, you worry that either people are going to take it the wrong way. They're going to take it as basically a way to say that like, oh, literally anyone who complains is participating in cancel culture, right? Anyone who calls out an abuser, anyone who complains about racism or, or bigotry, that like anyone, you know, there's a lot of people who use cancel culture to, to sort of dismiss all complaints like that. Um, so I worried about, you know, it being sort of a video I made being used the wrong way by the by that kind of person. And then I also worried about, um, yeah, the, the, the risk from sort of being attacked by people on my, my own side in internet leftist politics and the way that it's kind of difficult, because it is so difficult to have a kind of nuanced take on this topic, uh, it's just something that I wanted to avoid until I felt that I had basically no choice but to do a video about it. Um, which again, you know, I was a little bit reluctant to do a video about canceling while I was being canceled, but <laughs> it, it was, you know, fresh on my mind and it was kind of the only thing anyone was talking to me about online. So I figured, well, I guess now is the time but it, it did take me a long time to think about how I wanted to do it, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about your own cancellation? Because you use it as part, it, it's part of the device that you use to explain your, for lack of a better term, theory of cancellation. You lay out sort of certain ground frameworks and rules of cancellation. There's the generalization that happens where you go from just like, oh, this person said this specific thing to this person is problematic. There's the transitive problem where if you're associated with someone who is now problematic, yeah. then you can also yourself be canceled. But talk about what you were going through specifically that you used to help you work through the video. Well, I guess my most recent like, canceling was because in the previous video, I had had a voiceover actor for a 10 second clip. Um, and it was a sort of well known trans man named Buck Angel who. It was someone who had been involved in the community for decades. I was w aware of him well before I even transitioned. And I thought it would be cute to have him read this like John Waters line. So that uh, turned out to be the source of this massive controversy because Buck Angel is someone who a lot of people within the trans community um, sort of are really upset by some of the things that he says about you know, what it means to be trans. It sounds like he doesn't include non-binary people potentially, it's, or, you know, that, that, that's that's what they think. So um, because I had worked with him, I've had this public association with him, I'm now responsible for everything he's ever said, everything he's ever tweeted. And it's either my job to condemn him totally or to be seen as agreeing with everything he's ever tweeted. So... Um, you know, that put me in this, what I felt was like an impossible situation where on the one hand, I'm being like, like completely held accountable for all this stuff I don't even believe. And on the other hand, it seems like the only way I can get out of that is to condemn this person who is like an elder in my community who has done decades of good activism. And I'm supposed to be just like totally condemn him outright because of what people are saying on Twitter. I didn't feel good about doing that. So I basically was stuck. And because I was stuck, I decided to make a video about this situation of being stuck. Um, but, but yeah, as you say, like, um, I, I talk about these, like, I call them a like cancel culture tropes. Like, 
which is how you get to be viewed as basically a horrible, horrible person, which is usually <laughs> what cancel culture fr- frames you as. And so, like, the, you, a, lot, a lot of times you lose the particular details of what it even is that you're accused of. Um, so, for I think an example that's easier to understand, I use this, you know, famous uh, case of this makeup uh, beauty guru, James Charles. He's one of the biggest YouTubers who, I guess, he... Uh, well, he's accused of all kinds of things, but, but um, you know, like one of the things is like he's called like a racist on Twitter all the time. And basically the evidence for that is that three years ago, he tweeted a joke about his friend mixing up E. coli with Ebola. And it was framed in such a way he was like, oh, I hope I don't get Ebola in Africa. And some people thought that was racist and insensitive, which, okay. Uh, I, I can see that maybe being a conversation worth having. But the thing is, like, when three years later, you've gone from, like, James Charles made an insensitive joke about Ebola, that gets generalized to James Charles made a racist joke. And then that gets what I call, like, essentialized. Like, like we're now just making this the essential property of James Charles. James Charles is a racist, which now we've, like, lost all nuance. And I don't even know what we're talking about anymore. Yeah, I mean, we see it in the political context. I would say this has been done to to Tulsi Gabbard. You don't have to co-sign this view. But, you know, she has a meeting with Bashar al-Assad in Syria because she believes in this principle of diplomatic engagement. And you can think she's naive for having that meeting or think that meeting was wrong, et cetera, et cetera. That's fine. But it goes from that to she's an Assad apologist, to yeah. she's a dictator lover, to she's a, somehow a Russian asset, which is what then comes out of the mouth literally of Hillary Clinton, right? So that's how yeah. that's how it works. And as to your point, look, you can disagree with the original action. You can think that that was an issue. We can have a conversation about the appropriate engagement overseas, et cetera, et cetera. But people lose sight of what you even, where the complaint even came from, and there just becomes this general impression or idea that this person is toxic, wrong, illegitimate, evil, et cetera, et cetera, and the the details and the particulars get lost. And if you even dare to associate with them, have a conversation with them that's other than just like screaming at them, you know, if I had her on the show and just yelled at her for 10 minutes, that'd be fine. But if you want to actually engage with their ideas, whoa, that's, that's completely unacceptable. Now you have also taken on whatever the qualities are of that person. I did want to ask you, though, um, you know, coming from the perspective that you come from, do you feel like the, the bar is raised even higher for you, that there are even higher standards set for you because you're seen as a representative of a, a vulnerable community? Oh, 100 um, percent. I think that because I am a highly visible trans person at a time when there's sort of not a lot of good trans representation, uh, there is an extremely high bar because people are sort of um, expecting me to be the one who represents them. And so I, you know, if I mess up according to whatever they think messing up is, that means that not only did I do a thing they think is bad, it's almost like I didn't think they think it's bad in their name. And that's this kind of betrayal, I guess, that, you know, if I was just some random person, it, it wouldn't be. Um, and that does make things harder, um, especially because, um, you know, everyone, every trans person disagrees on what they think is the correct representation and the correct way to do things. So there's always going to be a, a group of people who think I'm doing it all wrong, that I'm embarrassing everyone, that I'm, uh, you know, making things worse, that I'm the reason everyone hates us, or that I'm, you know, taking the side of our oppressors, or whatever, however you want to put it. Yeah, that's a very hard place to be in. I mean, ultimately, how do you feel about the response to the video? Are you glad you put it out there? Do you think it's been received in the way that you wanted it to be? Oh, I'm, I'm very glad I put it out there. Um, yeah. I think that the response has been, over, it's been overwhelmingly positive. I think that reading some of the responses people have written um, hearing other people's stories like this is kind of a thing that people are dealing with very frequently today on social media especially and kind of at all levels of, of discourse like whether it's big like politicians like huge you know pu- public figures or whether it's like little Facebook groups with 200 people the dynamic is exactly the same um, which is yeah as, as you said earlier it's a kind of like corruption of criticism that instead of being able to take people aside and like criticize their actions or some particular thing they did, 
you know, this all gets turned into this public shaming, public humiliation kind of activity where we're not really criticizing a person's actions anymore. We're just kind of trashing them, saying they're a terrible person. Right. And the, the and this you, you cover in this in the video, too. You aren't actually looking for them to reform. You're looking for them to be destroyed. And those are two very, very different things. A constructive conversation, constructive criticism, and trying to have someone canceled and exiled from polite society, um, you know, from here on out are two very different things. Natalie, I said this to you before, but I'll say it again. We really appreciate having you on the show, but I really value the vulnerability that you put into your videos, how much of yourself you put out there. And I can say it means a lot to me, and I know it means a lot to a lot of people. So thank you so much for that. Uh, you're very welcome, and thank you very much. Have a good day. And we'll have more rising for you right after this.